Well, good afternoon. If you would uh, please take your seats. We'd like to get started. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all uh, to the third annual Student Success Conference at the University of South Florida. It's uh, so wonderful this afternoon to see so many representatives from across campus, from students uh, to staff to faculty and the le leadership of the institution. Uh, as we've often said before, student success is everyone's responsibility at the university and that's why it's so heartening to see you all here. To welcome us this afternoon, please join me in coming up to the podium, our president, Dr. Judy Genshaft. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, we're pleased. Welcome to our visitors to the University of South Florida. Thank you so much for joining us and um, helping to celebrate our students and those that teach our students. It is such an honor to host the four United States Professors of the Year honorees. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> this is the first time that they have come together since they were uh, announced and awarded this prestigious uh, honor in Washington, D.C. So we brought you all together and we're really thrilled that you're here. And please join me in welcoming Lois Roma Dealey, Professor of Creative Writing in Paradise Valley Community College in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, there you go. Christy Price, Professor of Psychology at Dalton State College in Dalton, Georgia. Todd Pagano, Associate Professor in the Department of Science and Mathematics and Director of the Laboratory Science Program at the Rochester Institute of Technology's National Technical Institute for the Deaf in Rochester, New York. And I'll just stop there for a moment because when he left, he was the only one that had difficulty flying in because he had to wait for the snow to stop and for the ice to de-ice the Here's airplane <laughs> and he is the one in Florida now that is wearing both a t-shirt a, a shirt and a sweater and a jacket so you're you're here and you are prepared for air conditioning and of course our own yes <laughs> professor of mechanical engineering Atar Ka who has made us so proud with the incredible work that he's doing with our students, as well as tens of thousands of engineering students around the world who access his lessons through social media and YouTube. And some of you may have seen his billboard, <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, each of the professors has been recognized for the creative and innovative approach they bring to education and for their unwavering dedication to students. Those of us who dedicate our lives to education share a bond in our strident belief that we do not succeed unless our students succeed. Each student holds within themselves tremendous capability and capacity to make a real difference in this world and is both a challenge and an honor for educators to nurture that potential. And today what we'll do is we will learn from those who are at the top of their game and literally the best in the business and we will learn from them not only how to be creative and cutting edge in the time-honored tradition of teaching, but how to remain inspired and keep the task part of this profession fresh and exciting. 
Now, I don't want any pressure on any of <laughs> <laughs> But as um, the University of South Florida is president for nearly 13 years, there has never been a day when I did not believe that this university had the ability to change our region, our state, and even the world for the better. For all those, for all that this work demands of us, it remains a great, great privilege to be a part of shaping the dreams and ambitions of a new generation, or even our older generation, looking to make a fresh start in our changing world. So we honor those who have elevated teaching and student engagement to an art form, and we look forward to learning from you so that you, we all may serve our students better. Thank you again for joining us, and I want to thank all of those that are on the panel because I always say you bring honor to us by being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Genshaft. And now to bring some remarks on behalf of the faculty, our President of the Faculty Senate, Dr. Greg Teague. Thank you, Provost Wilcox. It is a privilege, indeed, to continue the welcome, especially to our distinguished guests, and to all in the audience, including the many faculty who are here to celebrate and learn from our most outstanding colleagues in the profession. I was asked to say a few words given my role in the Faculty Senate, which makes sense. Faculty to faculty to faculty, something of a self-help group. <laughs> Hello, my name is Greg, and I'd like to learn how to teach better. <laughs> Peers at higher stages will draw us up, as in a self-help group. Perhaps the most thing, helpful thing that I can do for those who did not uh, see anything of the award ceremony is to reflect on some of the words spoken there by leaders of the sponsoring organizations. I'll start by taking quite directly from the comments of John Lippincott, president of the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. He described these four professors as exceptional for their intentional, innovative, and inspirational approach to the classroom experience. They are intentional because they guide the process of learning through strategic use of carefully designed pedagogies, helping students achieve defined outcomes through multiple tested techniques. They are innovative because they use multiple technical and interactive tools to engage students in learning. And they are inspirational, not just through their subject matter knowledge, but because they exhibit great passion for teaching for their own lifelong learning and for making a difference in the lives of students. What we need as a field is to emulate these models of excellence on a large scale. What we are doing here is consistent with some ideas about how we might do that. Anthony Brick, president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, has explicitly imported strategy and framework from another field where practice also profoundly affects us all, healthcare. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement has articulated a triple aim. In short form, better care, better health, lower cost. For Brick and Carnegie, the, the triple aims of educational improvement are increasing overall effectiveness, enhancing student engagement, and becoming more resource efficient. Thus, as with healthcare, we are challenged to improve the process and the outcomes without at the same time making the enterprise more expensive. As with healthcare, we will need to use the science of improvement. Best practice is no longer necessarily just whatever we ourselves learned, however we learned it. Doctor knows best has gone the way of house calls in horse-drawn buggies. We too should move our practice forward using the best evidence for what works. Our panelists do this through taking a scholarly approach to teaching and learning incorporating findings from the literature whenever possible to serve their students' needs. And, as with healthcare, we will be most effective in taking ever better teaching to scale if we incorporate lessons from the science of implementation. What we are doing here is actually a good example. 
In implementing evidence-based practices, we are most disposed to learn from our peers. Notwithstanding the partial utility of various external incentives and compulsions, we progress best in complex endeavors like ours when we are drawn to greater heights by the shining examples provided by well-informed early adopters and thought leaders among fellow practitioners. Self-help. Our outstanding professors are devoted practitioners of continuous quality improvement in the classroom, whether actual or virtual. Again, our challenge as a field is to take these examples to scale. One of the Carnegie Foundation's six principles of improvement is that we cannot improve at scale what we cannot measure, referring to key outcomes and processes. But we don't really measure very well what our honorees actually do, certainly not yet well enough to take to scale, in part because we still need progress in defining just what that is. In the meantime, however, we can define great teaching by showing great examples, as Martha Cantor, Undersecretary of Education, noted. These outstanding professors illustrate the importance of critical features of great teaching, building on strong positive relationships, using a range of tools and techniques, ensuring real world relevance, having deep commitment to their students' success, providing them opportunities, and most of all, perhaps, exemplifying learning as a lifelong process, being, as we are told by another great teacher, we must be, the change we wish to see in the world. So let us now do our part in advancing the art and the science by learning from these great teachers, Lois Romadili, Christy Price, Todd Pagano, and Otar Kaul. for uh, providing those words that will uh, prompt us to reflect throughout the next couple of hours, I am sure. Let me share with you something of the, uh, the structure of this afternoon's conversation, and I do want this and expect this to be a conversation. You haven't come here to listen to me or other members of the University of South Florida community, uh, with the exception of one very special member who's being recognized this afternoon, but rather you've uh, come to hear and to learn from some very special uh, members of the academy that have taken precious time away from their classrooms uh, to join us. You've often heard President Genshaft and I echo that nothing is more important at the University of South Florida than the success of each and every one of our students. Uh, executing on that expectation uh, in large part uh, falls on the shoulders of our Vice Provost for Student Success, Dr. Paul Dussel, and uh, the, the more recent appointee, Dr. Kevin Yi, who heads up the Academy for Teaching and Learning Excellence at the University of South Florida, otherwise known as Atlee. Uh, they and their teams have uh, worked hard over the past several weeks to pull this, uh, this event together, and I'd like to, at the outset, just recognize uh, their efforts. Please, if you will join me. <laughs> Even as we've been wrestling over the past few years with understanding this phenomenon uh, of, uh, of student success, I think what we've come to realize that student success means many different things to many different people. To students, uh, to parents, uh, to elected officials, uh, our admissions directors, our financial aid director, our student affairs personnel, professors, department chairs, deans, our career center director, our, our alumni director, and our dean, or vice president, excuse me, of development. Uh, those that uh, track our students, if you will, in the nicest possible way, from cradle to grave. I said in the nicest possible <laughs> way. As I said earlier, you're not here to, uh, to listen to me 
We want to give you an opportunity uh, to ask questions of our special guests. Uh, I'm going to lead off with one or two questions uh, and then we'll, uh, we're going to open it to the floor and give everyone the opportunity to step forward and challenge our guests. Uh, yet we had a nice lunch today, yeah. but uh, <laughs> there is no free lunch. <laughs> uh, we're going to put you to work, and uh, we're here. Uh, our students, our faculty, our staff, and staff are here to learn uh, from you. So I'm going to invite, uh, and we're going to start at the far end, Christy, because I know Christy is one of the shyer uh, <laughs> of, uh, of our guests, uh, just to uh, invite each of you to describe briefly your pathway into education and higher education in particular. And as you stepped into the classroom, what you only wish you knew then that you now know now about the importance of delivering quality instruction and uh, enhanced student learning. So Christy? <laughs> well, it was a it was a rough journey. There was just a short time in the state penitentiary yeah. before I... Uh, <laughs> I think I was one of those people who really stumbled upon teaching. And I just, by show of hands, how many of you actually planned a career in teaching? See, not even half of the audience here. And so in that way, many of us relate that I actually started out in counseling psychology and did, did want to help people. but. When I had my first opportunity to teach, fell in love with it immediately. Um, I, I think the, the critical component to all of this, though, as we've been talking throughout the day with some of the other people on campus, is that we truly care about students and care about their learning. And that has always been true for me. Um, my colleagues and I, we've discussed how we've had a mixed um, experience with professors ourselves, and I think one of the most motivating things for me, and I, tell, I say this to my students often, is that I want to be the professor that I wish I had. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so I think if, if our motivation is truly to help students learn, um, to inspire, to transform, uh, then we do all that we can, and that's how we end up where we are. Um, I'm going to let my colleagues speak to the question as well, though. Um, I'm a third generation Italian American. My grandmother came to this country. Um, I wanted very much to learn to uh, read and write, but um, and she would go to night school. She wouldn't even sit in the classroom. She would sit outside of the classroom. But her father didn't believe women should be literate. And so he followed her and he beat her. And so my grandmother was, could not read her, and she's very smart, but spent the whole rest of her life not being able to read or write English or Italian. Um, and so that's been a story in our family that really uh, has made education very precious to us. My, my older brother was a high school teacher for 33 years. He was the first um, person in our immediate family to graduate um, high school, never mind college. But he, he's older than me. He's like way older than me. Uh, <laughs> I said I like to remind him. Um, and he would come home. I was 12 years old. He would come home first year in college, and um, he would read to me um, Wordsworth at the kitchen table. He made me cry. We are seven. Oh, Nick, it's so sad. Um, he was, um, uh, had a minor in philosophy as well in, as in history. And, he, and so I would help him write his papers. He goes, come downstairs, come help me write the paper. Um, and, but what he taught me, and he, was, he, would, he would teach me uh, in spite of myself, you know, and he wouldn't let me get away with anything. I mean, he, he would say to me, what's the nature of good and evil? I'm like, I'm, I'm 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, this is absolutely true. I can remember it like it was yesterday. And he'd said to me, without skipping a beat, you're not thinking. What is the nature of good and evil? I'm like, oh, man. So I had to answer him. So I had that background, um, which kind of made education and learning uh, really um, my heart's compass. you know. But as an undergraduate, I have to say to echo, but Christy said, I didn't want to be a teacher because I didn't think I was any good at it. And I didn't want to do it. Um, and then I, I took a job 
in, um, as an undergraduate in a tutoring center, and the person who hired me interviewed me and said, well, you need to teach study skills. I'm like, I'm, I can't teach. And, and I did, and he said I was good at it, and uh, here I am now, so. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, it wasn't planned. That's my story. Thank you, Lois. Talk. <clears throat> so I'm a chemist by training. Um, I'm not a teacher by training. And I don't speak as eloquently as uh, my colleague Christy does about the pedagogy, pedagogy of teaching and learning. Um, I do think I did have some teaching embedded in my DNA. I come from a long line of uh, college faculty. Uh, both, of my, both of my parents are college faculty members. Um, and I, I think my position needs a, a little bit of explaining because I do teach at a very unique institution. Um, I, te I teach at Rochester Institute of Technology's National Technical Institute for the Deaf. Um, and you're going to hear a lot of my experiences comes from interacting with deaf and hard of hearing students. And I want to assure you, I'm not going to assure you that I have any good advice for you, but I'm going to assure you that some of the things that, that I do for deaf students uh, are certainly work in favor of my hearing students as well. So I, you know, I have a motto sometimes. I say, what's good for the deaf students is good for my hearing students. And I was telling the president at lunch, I mean, you know, what student couldn't benefit from a faculty member slowing down or from making you know, uh, presentations or, or things more visual? I mean, it, it, just, it just works. Uh, I do want to tell you, um, I do want to recognize some people. And I want to tell you, there, there's a unique uh, connection between USF and where I work at RIT's National Technical Institute for the Deaf. And in fact, the founding father of NTID is one of your own now, uh, Bob Frazino Sr. over here. Um, <laughs> When I say founding father, I mean it. He is the founding father of the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. And I had, I had the great opportunity to have lunch with him and hear some of the history of it uh, and, and, and this unique place he helped to build that he called the Grand Experiment. And could we educate these students? Could we give them the roots of their trade? Could we teach them their applied knowledge, self-advocacy, lifelong learning skills that are especially important uh, for these deaf and hard of hearing students. And could we do that alongside their hearing peers at Rochester Institute of Technology? So I had the good fortune of visiting the Global Center for Research, uh, Global Center for Hearing and Speech Research, which is run by his son, Bob Fresino Jr. Uh, and if folks haven't had the opportunity to go uh, visit that laboratory, I, I certainly encourage people to do some fascinating things. A whole cadre uh, of research is, is happening over there. Um, and. I, this is a segue into, you know, I, I want to say bravo to the University of Southern, uh, South Florida. USF has, um, th just the fact that you have a student success office, just the fact that you've hired uh, skilled individuals to, to think about student success, and it comes all the way down, all the way from the president. Everybody actually believes in student success here. And I think that is remarkable. I think that is cr incredible. You're both talking the talk and walking the walk here. Uh, so I want to thank you for doing that. I want to thank you for bringing this panel together, having me, giving me a chance to share the stage with these heavy hitters, uh, colleagues of mine. But I also want to thank you for having the forethought to have a skilled interpreter in our, in our presence. I didn't even think to request one. Uh, Kevin Yee of our Academy of Teaching and Learning Excellence um, had, had the good, good foresight to, to have this uh, interpreter, and I want to thank our interpreters for this so that we can make this presentation, presentation broadly available to many of my colleagues. I want to thank you for that. Um, and just a quick response to what, what I wish I had known on the first day of my teaching career on that eve. Well, I wish I had known sign language, because <laughs> I didn't, but I had to teach using, using sign language. But I really, I really wish that I had known that you could let passion drive your teaching. I really wish I would have, and the provost probably isn't going to want me to say this, he's going to try to figure out a way to mute my mic. <laughs> I wish I had thrown away my contract, my letter of hire, and my tenure guidelines. Because though they're important, they are, they're things you have to pay attention to. If you, if you teach with passion, 
if you really care about your students and the scholarship of your field, the other things will fall in place. And I wish I knew that when veteran faculty members told me that your wide-eyed, naive uh, passion for teaching was unsustainable, I wish I knew back then that I could tell them, well, politely and professorially anyway, <laughs> to get out of my path yeah. towards effective <laughs> teaching. Because you can do it. I want to take this opportunity first to thank my colleagues here to making the time to come here. Uh, I know that these people have been very busy uh, with all kinds of talks being given at different places. So please uh, accept my, uh, what should I say? Thanks thank you. for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. And also thanks to our university, uh, Dr. Dozel, Dr. Yee, Dr. Wilcox, and Dr. Ginshaft for making this a possible event here. I'm quite excited about this. In America, you have a lot of choices, and that puts a lot of cognitive overload on a people. Whether it's the food we eat, or the clothes we wear, or the cars we drive, or the majors we choose. In India, there's no cognitive load when I was growing up. You had only two tracks. You become an engineer or you become a doctor. Very easy choice. <laughs> Especially if you want to put food on the table every day. You could become a teacher or a banker, but uh, sometimes you may have to go without food, I suppose. So I chose engineering because the sight of blood just uh, made me wince. <laughs> so that's how we know that how I reduced my cognitive load. It was automatically done for me by my nature, I suppose. Uh, so I became an engineer and I wanted to work in India. I was very patriotic. I just didn't want to go to any other country. Uh, but something happened when I was working. I found out the lack of social justice in India uh, was driving me into a cocoon where I was trying to justify staying in India but at the same time, I did want to do something more than what I was meant to do. So I came to the United States for one single reason, and that was social justice. I can tell you without a doubt, although this country, my country, is not perfect, but it's the best country for social justice. No matter how much we talk about that things are not going the way they want to be, somebody wants them to be, I think uh, we still have a lot of work to do, but it is going in the right direction. So I did my master's and PhD because that was the only cognitive approach I could take. <laughs> so I did my master's and PhD and uh, I interviewed here in July 87 and they gave me a job right away on the same day. So I accepted it and here I am for the last 25 years. <laughs> so you might have thought that I had some kind of a story to tell. It is a nonlinear path which I have taken because I never wanted to become a teacher, although my father was a teacher and many of my relatives were teachers. Uh, but uh, it just, it just fell, into, fell into place. I found my advisor taking a lot of pains. He was an excellent researcher in those days in the late 80s, but he was putting a lot of emphasis on teaching as well. He will, uh, every class he started to work on, he will make new notes, uh, not those yellow notes which uh, most of us carry. <laughs> Uh, because of the sun being on them for so long. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I, I gained an appreciation for that. Here's an opportunity that I can come to a research university like USF where I can not only transfer knowledge, I can also create new knowledge. So that has been a path. But what uh, I would have wished that I had known when I first started was at that time the college orientation for new faculty was done by the college itself, not the university. Uh, so then Associate Dean Linus Scott said something very important to me, which I didn't listen. He said, don't think that content is king. Those are not his exact words, but he said, don't put too much pressure on covering the content. It's amazing how many times I have rushed through a topic uh, saying that, hey, I can feel good at the end of the day that I have covered the content, but I'm sure the students didn't get any of it. <laughs> so I've learned this lesson over time, and it took me about several years, because even my colleagues at that time would also say content is king. So I was, I was trying to listen to the majority as opposed to listening to my own gut instincts, what is important in education and what's not. Uh, the other thing uh, which uh, was not available in the late 80s was a lot of literature on learning sciences. So I wish I had at least read whatever was available at that time. We are very fortunate right now to have a lot of literature available in learning sciences. And we don't have to necessarily do the work ourselves to figure out what works and what does not work in a classroom. 
The other thing which I didn't realize, I taught a class in Clemson University. Uh, I was responsible uh, for, for the class itself. And uh, there were only 20 year olds in the class. They were all juniors, so they were 20, 21 years old. But when I came to USF, you had younger students, you had older students, and I treated them the same. What I have realized is that older students like more collaborative work, and also that they want to, uh, they, they immediately want to see relevance to what they are learning. Uh, I don't think they have any patience for uh, trying to figure out that we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. So those are the kind of things which I wish I had known when I first started. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that over the uh, past five years, we probably witnessed the most turbulent time in uh, the modern era, if you will, of, uh, of higher education, uh, most particularly characterized perhaps with, uh, with transformation that, uh, transformations that include greater emphasis on accountability. Uh, one of the challenges that our department chairs and uh, deans and other supervisors of our instructional uh, staff uh, wrestle with on an annual basis is how best to evaluate not just teaching effectiveness, but teaching excellence. Uh, let me ask the question, and uh, Lois, perhaps we can start with you on this one. Uh, how you personally uh, evaluate your effectiveness and excellence in your classroom and in your pedagogical behavior, if you will, uh, and how, what tips might you have for department chairs, college deans, uh, to help them move down this path? Um, I have a very simple way of beginning to do assessment, which I'm sure it won't make some of my colleagues happy when I say this, but I like to just say, How's it going? <laughs> you know, um, when I assign various, um, I teach creative writing, and I, uh, you know, you can't learn to write creatively unless you read, which seems obvious to us, but not so much to the students. Um, so you know, I will assign a certain um, Francis Bacon, as I was saying before, in one of my classes, and I told him, "Well, you're going to hate it, but you have to read it anyway." Um, and juxtapose it then with a lecture on MTV. Um, but I like to give them, I set a scale on one to 10, tell me the ultimate reading experience. And so I make them vote, you know, on it. But I also like to get them feedback on how are we doing in the classroom? Um, so the assessment I like to do from at the, is an ongoing thing. Um, from the beginning, I ask my students, do you know why you're here? And they always look at me like, you're the teacher. <laughs> you're supposed to know that. Um, and so I talk about the research that suggests that when you're finished with a college education, um, students retain like, what, 2% of what they learned in the classroom. So then I ask them, well, if that's so, why don't we then just do the time life you know, video series, you know, why are you here? So then we talk about process and, and so forth. So I begin a class like that. I make my students, I require them to keep uh, journal assignments, uh, creative writing, and some other classes. And then at the very end of the classes, I have, my creative writing students have to give me a portfolio and write me a paper on what they have learned and assess themselves. Um, my, my one freshman class, the last piece of assessment they have to do is to write a letter to the following class the next, the next year on what they wish they had learned. So it's a kind of a round robin. But I also try to listen to them. Um, I mean, really listen um, and, and try, to, try to adjust and look for what I call happy accidents and try to incorporate that. Christy? I was sitting here the whole time thinking, of course, uh, rate my professor is the number one way to know. <laughs> oh, I'm just smiling because I visit campuses regularly and consult and work on faculty development issues and, and faculty evaluation seems to be one of the hottest issues right now. And um, I'm an advocate for a holistic approach and I'm also sometimes upset administrators when I say, I think student evaluation 
uh, reflections from student evaluation should be used for solely reflective purposes and that we should be evaluated on our improvement of those and how we reflect on those and how we decide to improve on our student evaluations, not on the student evaluations themselves. Um, I work in a department myself where my colleagues hate me because we have a, an average and people throw the average and it's unfair to compare my psychology classes to political science classes to history classes. Not to say that political science and history aren't as fascinating as psychology, but apparently <laughs> students aren't feeling that way always on their evaluations. Um, so I do think there needs to be a lot um, of thought put into a, a, a holistic approach in terms of how we're evaluated. The other thing I noted is that I see a movement across the country toward, of course, undergraduate research, products and competencies. And so I feel like my, I know I'm doing a good job based on the products that students create, um, based on the competencies that they develop. Um, so everyone's familiar with Blooms and so forth. I feel like we do need to be looking at the hierarchy and what our students are creating, what they're producing, the skills that they're developing, um, and be evaluated on, on, on that. I will say one of the things that was most impressive to me about my colleagues on the panel is that we, uh, we came to DC each with a student um, supporting us and introducing us. And in talking to the students of my colleagues, that alone was evidence of how effective they are. Atar, uh, particularly, I remember talking to his graduate student. And one of the things that, that tells me he's very effective at what he does is the graduate student that he produced, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. And so I think we need to be looking at legacy. And um, I try not to drop um, resources quite frequently, but the one that's worth noting is um, things like backward design and deep thinks significant, creating significant learning experience books. She's a fan. Um, I think it's creating significant learning experiences and, and transformative experiences for students. So evidence that a student has been changed through the course. And I'm just lucky enough to teach things like social psychology in which the whole point is to transform the student's mind about culture and how they see culture and difference and so forth. So one of the ways I know that is that they, they're they thinking differently by the end of the course than they were at the beginning of the course. And they're acting and behaving differently as well. Um, and I also have the luxury of teaching things like counseling psych topics where we're talking about uh, relationships and interpersonal communication. And so I can, as Lois said, through student writing, see that they are um, applying the concepts of the course and so forth. So I do think it does depend on what you're teaching and what the mm -hmm. outcomes for that teaching are and so forth, um, but clearly holistic and perhaps Atar has some other things he want to say about that. Yeah. Atar, turn. please. Okay. Well, uh, I believe that teaching excellence, uh, the way one should be looking at uh, it is to see that whether People are doing things holistically, as Christy said. Uh, you cannot have assessment, which is only one kind. I have two daughters, and both of them went to universities in Florida. And uh, there were some classes where they simply had uh, multiple choice tests. And those were all knowledge-based multiple choice tests. So you're not making any kind, of, uh, thing, uh, any kind of evaluation or synthesis through those multiple choice tests. So it's very important for us to realize that when a student is coming into the class, that he or she is expecting that they will learn from that class. And it's our duty to make sure that they do learn. And one of the things which I look at when I do assess my students is to look at four steps. One is to see, have they acquired the knowledge? That's the first step. The second thing is to see that whether they apply that knowledge. And the third one is to see that, do they know when to apply that knowledge, which is the contextual sense. And the last one, which is the most important, which now is gaining a lot of traction, is to see that why they are applying that particular knowledge, which is the conceptual understanding of the course. So uh, I have some advice for my department heads, although a department head is very gracious about looking at those things, is to see that whether the students, or whether the teacher is doing those things in the classroom itself. Uh, so if, uh, if, if, if these kind of things are done in the classroom, I think uh, many, many classrooms will change. And one of the things which I do want to say is that many times the assessments which we do, uh, they might be only sporadic in nature, which means that uh, people might just give a midterm exam and a final exam, you're done. And that's not a good way of making students learn. It has been shown time and again, there was a recent paper written on what are the kind of things which help a student learn. 
Is it highlighting the book? Is it underlining the book? Is it rereading the book all the time and trying to understand it? They found two things which came at the top. The first thing is distributed practice, which means that if you have an exam which you're giving monthly every 30 days or so, the key number is 10 to 20 percent, which means that every three to six days, the student should be doing something. And you have to somehow not force the student, but to give him or her the opportunities of being able to do that distributed practice. And if that distributed practice is in an atmosphere which is almost represents the test itself, that's even better. So those two things, if uh, most of us will do, I think we'll see a lot of improvement in how our students are learning. And if those things are accounted for, then in the teaching evaluations of our faculty members, it would take a great step towards that. Bob? Am I lame for knowing what my ratemyprofessor.com <laughs> says about <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, It's good to be aware. It, <laughs> You know, I mean, it seems taboo, and it, these microphones set up in this way remind me of a <laughs> congressional right. hearing. But I, you know, I'll, I'll talk to, I'll talk to colleagues who will say, you know, Mr. Senator, I categorically deny having any knowledge of my RateMyProfessor.com evaluations. And maybe I am lame because I do care. Oh, I. <laughs> and yeah, I, care. Uh, um, I, I know it's not the most moderated. Uh, um, piece of evidence or piece of the puzzle, and I don't place primary um, importance on it. But I do, in general, care you know, what, what the students do think of me. Um, and and my, my advice to evaluating the student feedback anyway is similar to my advice about passion. Um, you know, you, I, you don't think about how to improve your student evaluations. You, you want to think about how do I improve student success in my classroom. And when you do so, yeah your evaluations are going to uh, resonate and, and increase as well. So I, I agree with um, Christy as well when she says that you, know, you have to bring in all these, it's a holistic process, you have to bring in these different uh, pieces of the puzzle. I think self-evaluation is enormously important and self-reflection and not doing something in the class just because you did it last year, whether it succeeded or not. Uh, I, I find myself to be one of my, my toughest critics. Um, and how do chair view, you mentioned that, for example, how do department heads deal with um, evaluating effective teachers? Well, uh, you know, like it or not, we live in a peer reviewed world. Uh, we do. I, you know, our publications are peer reviewed. If you want to borrow uh, telescope time on some of our large uh, national telescopes, it's a peer reviewed process. Uh, and, and I do think there can be some value in peer review of your, of your teaching efficacy. Um, personally, uh, again, I, I mentioned I'm a chemist by training, so I'm gonna have a quantitative answer, but I'm a teacher not by training, by, by good fortune. So I'm gonna have a more moral, ethical uh, answer as well. Um, quantitative answer is how, how effective are you as, as a teacher? Well, uh, I, I think you can put numbers on um, number uh, retention in your class. I mean, it, again, it's sometimes taboo to say so, but it's a valid thing to think about. There's a cost for educating a student, and paying attention to student success will help with those costs. Less students withdrawing from courses, higher graduation rates. Uh, I, I think these are part of the holistic puzzle, and I think it's okay to get quantitative a little bit in this. But personally, how, how I evaluate if I've been a successful teacher is to see if I've convinced the student, not, not just if I cared, if I convinced the student that I cared about their success in that course. If I convinced the student that I could uh, care about their success after the course, if they get a job or not, and there's another quantitative metric uh, to how effective of a teacher you were. If I haven't convinced the students that I intimately care about how they do in their course room and, and their, uh, their career, then I don't assess myself very well. I don't think I did my job. Interesting, Christy? Can I add to this? I don't know if out of order, but I'm looking at a checklist. I told Kevin that I didn't want to be the nerd on the panel who made handouts for people and so forth, but now in hindsight, <laughs> I think that um, because I do a lot of faculty development workshops and have a lot of self-reflective checklists on topics and things, one that I'm looking at here is a, a checklist on things that we can do to help students be successful. And I love that Qatar mentioned distributed practice. Um, and this kind of relates to what Todd was talking about as well. One of the other things related to that on my checklist is early and frequent low stakes assessment. 
um, with developmental feedback such that students reflect upon their own learning. So the movement, I think, is towards helping students take responsibility for their own learning, become more reflective learners, um, a lot of things that we need to do at the 1,000 and 2,000 level to create success, retention, progression, um, so that by the time they get into the programs and so forth, they, they are chemists, they are, <laughs> they're, but they're learning to learn as they go. Um, and I will, I'll send these to Kevin if he wants to distribute these <laughs> as well, and that might be helpful to folks. That's a great lead into my next question because uh, on occasion I hear from students that uh, surprise, surprise, mm -hmm. professors aren't living up to students' expectations. I also hear from faculty <laughs> that increasingly students aren't living up to the professors' <laughs> expectations. All of you have been in higher education for a number of years, some more than others. <laughs> But I wonder if you might comment on changing times and attitudes, expectations of students, of faculty, and vice versa. Porter? Uh, okay. Well, um, as I was saying in the first question is that uh, if you look at the top traits of good teachers when they followed them was uh, making an emotional connection with the students, and the second was high expectations. I'm not here to compromise on my last one, on the high expectations. Uh, in fact, sometimes I do get student comments saying that I expect too much from them. But I think uh, even in, you, it has been found out that even in inner city schools where you may find that there are not as many resources available, even there the students do want high expectations from their teachers. So I don't think we should compromise on that at all. Um, so far as my expectation of students are concerned, I think those are not changed very much because the word gets out that I have high expectations. So they do hunker down and uh, give me what they're supposed to do for themselves. Uh, so far as their expectations of me are concerned is that they have changed over the years. I'm supposed to be available 24 hours a day. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I have made some adjustments. So that means that I don't show up for eight hours a day to USF. So I try to distribute my time so that I can be there almost 24 hours a day. So I have a classroom discussion board on Piazza where students can ask questions at any, any time of the day. Either the student answers the question or the instructor asks the questions. I can also change the student's answer because sometimes they are conceptually not right answers. Uh, so if I'm able to meet those student expectations, uh, I think the students also rise to the occasion because they see that how much effort you are putting in to get, uh, to get to them as fast as you can. So I think it's a, it's a two-way street, and once that two-way street has the same mission of making them good, productive citizens of the society, I think we're in a win-win situation. Thank you. Lois. Yeah, I guess I would divide it up into two areas. One would be content, and one would be experience, the experience of the classroom. And so in terms of content, I don't, for me personally, I don't see much has changed, you know, since Socrates, at least for me. The Socratic method is what I like to use and one that I think is you know, effective and, and, and my students seem to respond well to that, to challenge them. They want to be challenged. They want to be, um, they want to learn. And I believe that, you, that, for me anyway, that you must have that real high expectation in a real positive way. I think if you go into a classroom thinking, oh, you know, this lazy students or whatever, you know, that's not going to work. I, I, I assume my students want to learn even if they don't know it, okay? <laughs> so there's that. But I think what's changed is the experience of the classroom. You know, um, I have my iPhone now because I was embarrassed into getting it last year. And they had my little flip phone. They said, I need an iPhone. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and, and so I am constantly, you know, this morning I was on answering questions. No, I'm not in Phoenix. I'm in Tampa there, you know. Um, so I think there's that expectation, uh, good and bad, of the experience of the classroom, which I don't think we've really, as educators, had a full discussion of where it's going. Um, so that, I think, is changing. But in terms of um, using the language of the course, using it in a way that relates to students' lives, to answer what I, call, I say to my students, you know, the so what question. 
Like, why is this important? Why should you learn it? Um, I think hasn't, hasn't changed. And I refuse to give them answers to that question. You know, they are required to, to, to think for themselves. And for many, uh, especially the young women, um, that is a, it seems to be something that oftentimes has not been presented to them um, in a positive way. Thank you, Todd. This is a timely question um, because I, I had lunch, as I mentioned, with Bob Frazina Sr. yesterday, and we were talking about expectations. And he said one of the uh, biggest barriers he had to, to establishing NTID was to <laughs> convincing people not to lower their expectations of these deaf and hard of hearing students. Um, you know, Bob also told me he's very proud of me for receiving this award and having uh, NTID represented here as well as USF. It's, it's a win-win day for, for Bob Frazina. But what I didn't tell Bob is, you know, early in my career, I made some mistakes and I did underestimate our students. And I didn't realize that some of our deaf and hard of hearing students could do uh, high level cutting edge research. I did not think that some of them could go on to advanced degrees or be productive members of the workforce. And I, and I was wrong. And I was a, I was a quick study. Um, and now I'm very proud of our staggering employment rate of our, of our graduates. The, um, the research that these students do with me, I mean, it's some of the best research that's ever been conducted. The data is, is just pristine. Um, and now, you know, probably to a fault, so if I come back next year, I'll probably say I went too far the other way. Um, you know, I, I always give my students every benefit of the doubt, uh, probably to a fault. So this is a good question and, and one I need to learn from because I need, I need to find that balance of expectations for my students. But as of right now, I, I tend not, not, to, not to doubt the students. And the challenge is, you know, with the students, and I'm glad that um, Christy's going to go after me because I'm going to lob up uh, <laughs> grapefruit here because you know she, she's an expert in this. I'm going to let her uh, speak eloquently about it. But you know the millennial student is a unique entity. It's a, it's a unique thing. Uh, they have unique needs. They have unique expectations about where, why haven't you responded to my email uh, yet? And sometimes, you know, sometimes they have you know expectations of being entertained even in the classroom. Um, and I'm not above that. I'm not above. <laughs> being a, you know, I've made plenty of fool of myself in front of the classroom, and why not? I mean, it, learning can be fun as well, but. I'm still trying to figure out the millennial student. I think they have a lot of qualities. We, talk, we spoke about some of the qualities at, at mm -hmm. lunch. They, they don't see uh, culture and race as much. They're very open-minded, good-hearted good people, I think. Um, but their way of learning is certainly different. Their demands of, of the teachers and their use of technology uh, is, is certainly different. So challenges, millennial student, Go. Yeah. yeah, right. You're Don't right. get some anybody and any one of us started on our research. You're going to have to cut me off here. But um, the thing that came to mind first is I, when I do a lot of workshops, I like to use um, student quotes from evaluations of professors. So one that comes to mind um, is the student said on the official evaluation of their professor, if I only had an hour to live, I would spend it with my professor. It was just this fabulous, sweet, wonderful, heartwarming, save it for your scrapbook kind of thing. But then the student went on to say, because my professor can make an hour seem like a <laughs> lifetime, right? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I do think, uh, Research and evidence suggests that the modern learner, and I, I had started out my initial research was on the millennial learner, but I did gather enough data um, of our non-traditional students to realize that I needed to change my title of my topic to modern learner because there were very few significant differences actually in the non-trads as compared to the traditional millennials, which is really kind of a mind-blowing, shocking thing that um, made my research not as significant as I thought it would be. <laughs> but, but so I, the characteristics, the things that I'm thinking of when you look at what's ideal, I, I will, I've got a list in front of me of the top five, and I don't think anybody will be surprised by this. Um, and actually, I have a six on the ideal learning environments for millennials. 
Uh, the number six I include typically because I think it's important. Their expectation is that we provide supportive materials and that might be online support, um, it may be handouts and things like that physical. But the idea is that learning needs to be guided. Uh, we, the discussion that we had earlier also was that they've been inundated with information from the time they were very young. We talked about my own child. Um, you know, ever since he was born, a click of the mouse and they can find any information that they want, how to make a paper airplane, the life cycle of a frog. It's very different to our own experience. When I was in college just, just over 20 years ago, um, I wanted to learn for the sake of learning. Information for information's sake was something I valued. It is not something that the modern learner values. They've had that access to that information. So as Lois said, the real trick is to make it relevant. The challenge that I had when I started 20 years ago is very different now than it was back then. And I think, and I don't know if this speaks to your student population at USF, but typically where I'm traveling, we have lots of open enrollment. And <laughs> this is a horrible quote, but one of the things that I realized when my child went to school, everyone told me, kindergarten is the new first grade. It's very rigorous, right? I was very a little freaked out by that. But what I like to say is, and it was true, uh, but that high, uh, college is the new high school. Everyone's going, right? 20 years ago, I had a student population that was very college prep prepared. I could say, write a research paper in a freshman intro psych class, and they all knew what I was talking about, and they'd all had written a research paper, and they were all prepared to do so. I cannot walk into the classroom and say that at this point in time. And it does, even, it, even institutions who aren't really open enrollment institutions have these same issues. So you may have about a third of the class that says, I'm good to go with writing a research paper. Another third, kind of, I get it. I got to start out with a question. I got to do a lit review, but I need some help. And then another one third that says, I've never written a research paper, and I really don't even know how to go about this. So one of our great challenges is to guide the learning process. Um, and I, I, the other, I talk about my five big R's for the new millennium. So one of them is relevance. The other is research-based methods. So what I'm finding is that we're still using these methods that are not evidence-based. So I really highly emphasize uh, resources like Ambrose's How Learning Works or SUSE's How the Brain Learns um, so that we guide, we, we shift our methods um, to what we know actually works as opposed to just doing what we was modeled for us, do unto. And that's what I, I felt like when you asked the first question, I wasn't really prepared because I said, I want to be the professor that my, I didn't get, the, the professor I wanted to um, have when I was in college. Um, but the real issue was that I had a lot of professors who, um, you know, just used traditional methods that weren't very effective. Um, so I, I want to use methods that we know are supported by research. Um, in terms of the other hours, we may get to those later, but the, the other additional thing I want to say back on this list of the ideal learning environment is the number one thing was that it be interactive and participatory. Um, so variety, and on my narrative portions of my survey, because I'm always using mixed methods, which I think is the way to go if you're doing um, research in terms of um, what's working in the classroom and what's not. Um, it was very revealing because over and over again, more than 600 surveys, I read no lecture only. No lecture only. <laughs> so one of my newer um, presentations is about the mini lecture, and we talked earlier today about the key to the mini lecture is making sure that it is mini. Um, and so, but I have many other tips like that. But the idea that, that variety is really critical for the modern learner um, because they've been raised in a completely different environment than most of us. Thanks, Christy. I'm going to ask one more question and then I become the roving mic <laughs> so you can get ready with your questions in the audience. But Lois, it, it follows up on a comment you made, and that is envisioning the classroom of the future or the learning environment of the future. And of course, there's been uh, ample reference to technology and the impact. Uh, I think what I'm hearing is mostly positive uh, from your vantage point. But perhaps if uh, each of you would just close your eyes for a moment and imagine uh, the classroom or the learning environment in the higher education sector uh, a decade out. Where do you, or maybe a decade's too far, uh, 
you have license, full license, to define the uh, parameters. Todd, do you want to start on that? Sure. I, maybe, maybe I'm not a visionary, but I'm hoping you know that far in advance, or I'm thinking that far in advance. Uh, is it too far from the direction that we're headed? I think the classroom of the future, the, the lecture of the future, will will have mixed modalities. Um, there are different uh, time constraints that people put on as to what the uh, retention time is of individuals. And I partially fell asleep listening uh, to yeah, just right, exactly. so, got well, uh, I, if, uh, if it's any consolation, when he mentioned five to six years out, I thought, I'm just five to six years out from retirement, so all I can envision is a margarita and a beach chair, so I can't even go that far. But I need to hang it up, don't I? But, <laughs> I think you do have, you have to pulse your, um, your classroom with a whole bunch of different mod modalities. Mm -hmm. uh, Tara was saying this morning, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with some chalk talk. And I, I have some, mm -hmm. some colleagues who can pepper a whiteboard and do it well, and, and do it right, well, and, right. the and the students learn from it. But I, I'm a proponent of not overdoing that. So mix it in with some multimedia, uh, some animation, some active learning, of course. So I, I think in doing so, you hit, obviously, the very learning modes mm -hmm. of, of your students. Uh, so I don't think that's that novel. But I'd like to see, you know, I, I think we're going to have to go in that way to, again, reach the millennial student. What's the next generation of students going to be called, you know? Um, gosh, I forget now. I just went Anyone? blank. I think they're calling him Z. Z. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Z student, we might have to do this pulsing method in, in our classrooms even more. Um, I'm going to continue, I think, to not fight with the wonders of science. Um, you know, I used to, you know, I used to teach higher level chemistry and, it, you know, I used to go in admitting to the students, this is hard and this is going to be, this is going to be abstract. Um, but then I, then I learned to adopt it and there, there, there's so much wonder in science and, and innate, um, care and curiosity about student, students' environment. You mentioned your son. You you go to a luau. He's just fascinated by fire. I have fire. That's, that's a sign of development of antisocial personality. <laughs> fascinated by fire, so we're concerned. No, no. At this that, point, we're concerned. That's why. No, that's why I became a chemist. Actually, right? <laughs> you're fascinated by fire. But you know, every, every day in my classroom, there, there is and will be some form of fire. Hopefully, control. <laughs> but some kind of de demonstration, some kind right. of visual. An anticipatory set, even right. where you can gauge the student's learning style or their level of understanding, and maybe they won't understand what this hopefully controlled explosion or fire right. means at the beginning of the class. But by the end of class, hopefully, it'll make all uh, make sense to the students. But again, that's 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 one more method of mixing things up in the classroom. I, I think that's probably where we're headed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I experiment with the flipped classroom this semester, which basically means that uh, you have your videos, let's suppose, on YouTube or some other medium, and you let the students uh, watch the videos at home, and then they come to the classroom, and we have a discussion. Um, it has, I only flipped half of, the class, half of the class because I basically selected the topics which were more conducive to the flipped classroom. And I also asked them to write 25 words, which was a lot to ask of an engineering student. <laughs> <laughs> that what they... 25 words that make sense. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and I do, I'm all uh, different. Yeah, and I do ask them to write complete sentences. That's, that's another challenge. Um, and uh, in, in, in those 25 words, they have to tell me that what they didn't understand about the topic. And I get those comments before I come into the classroom. Uh, some students took the short way out saying that I understand everything about the topic. <laughs> so I had to change my question. What did you find interesting about that particular <laughs> chapter? So I get those 25 words, I read them, and then I try to figure out what kind of clicker questions I can ask in the classroom and see that what, what they have learned and what they have not learned. So there's a movement which is going on, which uh, most of you must have heard about, the MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, and people are thinking that it's going to replace all of us here, including the ones who are right here. Uh, <laughs> There was a saying by an RPI dean who said that if a CD-ROM can replace an instructor, he should be. And I have the same saying, if a MOOC is going to replace an instructor, he should be. Uh, and what, what's going on there is that most people, the evangelists of MOOCs, they are looking at it as more from a selling point of view. They're salesmen, just like a, 
anybody trying to sell cars or sell houses. Uh, they're not interested in figuring out whether it's going to be good for this, eventually good for the society itself. So that's where the administrators of the university, uh, especially state universities, uh, will have to make a decision about how much of that MOOCs to really let uh, creep into the, into, into the, into the uh, college experience. Because we already find out that the AP experience itself is limited in some ways that we don't uh, transfer all the AP classes. Uh, and the same thing will be with MOOCs also, where you may be able to transfer some of the experience which you have gained and gained through MOOCs. Uh, what, what I've seen is that uh, there might be a rush towards the flipped classroom or a rush towards MOOCs, because when I ask these clicker questions after they've already learned the material, I make sure that they watch the videos because they have taken an online quiz at home. Mm -hmm. So it's not they can say, hey, I watched the video and here I am. So, and that's part of the grade itself. And I give this clicker quiz, I have four choices uh, in this multiple choice clicker quiz. I get sometimes 25% for each of those choices. So you're already finding out the kind of conceptual knowledge they are deriving from just by looking at the videos themselves uh, is not right. So 25% of the people, 75% uh, of the people are not getting the concept right. So I don't believe that the instructor is going to get replaced. I think there's going to be a, a lot of people say there's going to be a flipped classroom in my, in my, um, in eloquence of my words, uh, I'm going to say there's going to be a shift rather than a flipping taking place. So what's going to shift is that what the role of the instructor is going to be. So you're going to get a lot of the trans uh, transfer information through the videos or through Acrobat PDF files or through a, a simulation. But in the classroom itself, you are going to uh, look at the higher order th thinking. And, and that's why it's called the flipped classroom, that you are not doing the higher order thinking at home, but you're doing it in the classroom itself. However, there's a challenge there. I have 85 students in my class. I had a rough time trying to do that higher order thinking, uh, making them think higher order in the classroom itself. So it's going to work with very small class sizes. So that's an opportunity to see that if we want to have these flipped classrooms and give a much richer experience to our students, we do have to think about class sizes. Lois. Yeah, um, I have some concerns for the classroom of the future. Um, I was having this conversation with my son and, and he was saying that he thought perhaps in the future the premium educational experience will be face to face. Mm -hmm. And so that was such an interesting uh, comment from him. Um, and it made me think about, um, made me think about access to education. It made me think about the privilege of educational experience. So I, I have some, some, concerns about that. Um, as far as envisioning the future, I can tell you what I hope for the future. And that's better. It's more comfortable with that. I would hope in the future that we continue to reach back into the past and reach towards whatever that future is and, and bring it, bring it uh, make it relevant to our students, engage their imaginations. And, and, and as I was saying earlier, there is, you really need to understand what I mean when I say by engaging their imaginations. I mean that in a Coleridgean sense, that, um, that the information, the knowledge, enters into them in a significant, relevant way. And that my hope, my hope for my students, for our students, for our culture, is that that the education transforms them and then they can go out and, and, and make the society the one that it should be, which is gonna take a long time, I think. Um, so that's what I'm hoping for the future and that we use technology wisely, uh, that, we, that we still stay with some of the basics, like a clear, organized, relevant, tell me what it's about kind of lecture, how it relates to me, um, and then use the technology uh, we use it, it doesn't use us. Because I think it can be kind of fun to just create all these things with, and kind of lose sight of the, the thesis of the class. The thesis of the class, so that's what I'm hoping. Thank you. Christy? I went over on the last one, do I still get to respond? You get a, okay. you get a <laughs> well, let me say, I think the future is here and it's over there in your smart lab. Oh, that yeah. is what we're looking forward to, I think, in the sense that, yes, <laughs> congratulate yourselves on the smart lab. But it is a flip and it is a, a kind of emporium combined type hybrid method there, but it is 
um, something that I see happening nationally and is to great effect. In other words, having a high impact. And, and there are some literature on high impact practices. And I think that's the movement of the future. And if you're not familiar with personalized learning solutions, I, check, the, check it out. And, and my simplest analogy is it's almost like Amazon, and some people don't like this. <laughs> But the idea behind Amazon is I read a lot of literature on higher education and teaching and learning and on leadership, um, pornography. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, but Amazon knows what I read, right? Amazon knows. And so it sends me messages to meet my needs, right? That's individualized, personalized learning. I can't do that for 250 students. So my point is, when a student struggles to find the slope of a line, this software knows. It's analyzed thousands of other students and knows if you miss the slope of the line, here are the things you need to go back over, right? It can do so much more than we can do individually. And so uh, my thought is we need to embrace that and use that in partnership, not without, and as, as Atar said, that means our role shifts. It doesn't disappear. Our role becomes, I know I hate the terminology, guide on the side as opposed to sage on the stage, but the idea behind the flip, and this is once again supported by all the research, is that we need, and if there's one thing I'm still struggling to do, it is make more time, class time, processing time. So um, as you said, we can do a lot on the front end and have students, the learning-centered model says, traditionally we disseminated information. They were first exposed to it in class, and then we told them, go read about it. This learning center, if you read Blumberg is my favorite source, but Mary Ellen Weinberg, uh, Mary Ellen Weimer, Judith Blumberg, all their learning centered work. The idea is it's multi-directional. We need more time with students delving directly into the content, working on the content, applying the content. So more class time as processing time, less class time as dissemination time, basically. Well, I promised a conversation, and this is your chance. Uh, what I ask you to do is you take the mic, please briefly introduce yourself, and then ask a question. We don't need statements. <laughs> <laughs> ask a question. You, might, you may direct that question to the full panel or individual members of the panel, uh, and we'll move on to the next one. Who would like to be first? Hi there. My name's Joan K. Well, I'm a professor in the College of Education and Secondary English Education. And last night I had the distinct pleasure of attending one of the last lecture series presented by a colleague of mine, Dr. Barbara Cruz. It was fabulous. And one of the questions we were left with, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the last lecture with Randy Pausch, right? Mm -hmm. yes? yes? No? Yes. Okay. So at any rate, one of the questions we were left with was what would be um, the one message that you would give if you had to give the last lecture, what would it, the topic be? Obviously, for me, it would be poetry. The poetry and the humanities teaches us why we're human. And uh, that would be, if I had anything to say, it would be that. And, 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 and that poetry is for, you know, and I sound like a commercial, which it is, but it's for everyone. It's not from out there. It's, it's, it's here and it's part of what makes us as a, as a people, you know, um, who we are. So that's what I would say. That's, that, would be, that would be my message. Lois, you'd like to know that uh, while Dr. Kaywell was attending the last lecture last night, we had Jory Graham yes, across yes, campus yes. meeting with uh, Pulitzer Prize winner and celebrated a poet, yes. meeting with uh, a large group of other faculty, students, and uh, members from the community. The arts, uh, poetry are incredibly important to it's, this, uh, this academic month. community. Yes. Would anyone else like to uh, well, I think offer? I, go ahead. I, I think if, if, if you're asking content-wise, I mean, I, 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 I do research that I think is going to give the world access to safe drinking water. And I could talk about chemistry, but if I had one lecture to give, it'd be about teaching science. And it'd be about the passion for teaching and how to get that. And it, it, even the chemistry of passion. And there is some chemistry. There is some science to passion. 
and different uh, biomolecules that are released um, at different times. There's one study recently in the in Scientific American where they, you know, uh, subjected different types of people to, or different people to a crying baby. I don't know if people are familiar with this study. And they found that um, musicians, classic trained musicians, had a more severe emotional response to these children, and, uh, or to the, to the crying. And my colleagues over in the, uh, in the Global Hearing and Speech Center would appreciate, you know, they, they, they hooked these people up, and there's a mechanical, biomechanical reason for why people respond this way, or why people were passionate about this this crying baby. Was it something that the musicians did during their training that evolved, or is it just that musician, that, that type of person tends to become a mu musician? Either way, there are, there are a release of chemicals. There, there is a biomechanical uh, substance to passion. So I'd somehow probably combine chemistry and passion for teaching, but the, the, the take home message would be, showing people how to be passionate about what you do. As I said, I'm a teacher by good fortune, and I want to share how, how, how other people can feel that way as well. OK, I have a question. I'm Phil Mota. I'm a biologist. I teach anatomy, which is quite challenging sometimes. Sure. What is the single, for each, this is for all the panel members, the single most important thing to be an effective teacher you have found? Is it empathy? What is it? The single one most important thing? I have two, so I don't know whether yeah. you'll be ready for two. <laughs> uh, well, the, the two which I've been talking about, I talked to most of my colleagues also about that, is to make an emotional connection with the student. And that does take one-on-one -on -one time. Students are not going to open up to you just because you're talking to them. You have to create a trust uh, between the students, and mm -hmm. then they will tell you which, something which they don't even tell their parents. So that's, that's the second one is to have high expectations of the students, to have high expectations of the students. Uh, you might be thinking, uh, some people might think that uh, uh, if, you don't, if you lower your expectations, uh, students are going to like you because then they're doing less work. But time and again, I've seen that whenever I have lowered my expectations for one reason or the other, uh, they, they have not really felt comfortable about it. I'm going, to make, I'm going to make this real quick because I've already, I've already spoken about it. I, I believe it is that passion that you can have. And as I mentioned before, actually convincing the students that you care about their success in this course and beyond. Uh, not just saying it, not just actually doing it, but convincing them that you do. Uh, that connection, I think this leads to what you said, that, that, that connection, that, that welcoming uh, nature, I, I think has gone a long way in my teaching. Um, piggybacking what everyone said, I would say... Uh, respect, respect for the discipline and respect for the students. And as I tell my students, my grading reflects the fact that I respect your intelligence, you know. And so, you know, that's hard to argue with, I think, although they do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, that's what leads into mine, and it is care about students and their learning. Um, but I do think once they know that you care, they'll receive that feedback in a completely different way. Yes. And that I think is one of the big problems that we have is that if we give feedback from a place of where they don't feel like we truly care about them and they're learning, then they reject it and we don't, we're not successful anyway. So we might as well figure out a way to show them <laughs> that we do care about them and their learning and then they're very receptive to any feedback right. that we give. Right. Um, hi, my name is Philip Bishop. Um, Atar, you spoke earlier about the, uh, the shift towards massive open online courses and some of their limitations. And specifically, one of the things I would like to ask the panel about is there are some skills that we cannot transmit. And one of those, I think, is kind of a fuzzy word, but leadership. Mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, what role do you think leadership has in the profession of teaching? Is that yours? He asked you. You, yeah, you start. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll say the same. Philip, you talk to me. Welcome to USF. <laughs> okay. Well, I think leadership, uh, what I tried, I'm, I don't think I can teach leadership to my students per se uh, because I'm an engineering professor, so I got to figure out how to lead myself first. Uh, but what, what, what I try to emphasize in my students is that many times what happens is that when a student comes to my, uh, to my class, he says, you know, Dr. Kao, I'm spending about three hours on this thing, and my colleague is spending only 
one hour on this thing, he makes a higher grade than what I have made. And I think what happens is that many times we have these bright students in our classrooms. And what happens is that they get labeled bright. And they are now reluctant to accept that they make mistakes. They're reluctant to say that, hey, I spent double the time than you did to learn the same thing. And what I try to tell them is that if you put in that deliberate practice into whatever you are learning, I think you're automatically going to become a leader because people will follow you. Yeah, can I add, I love that this ties into a previous question about the future of education because I agree. I don't think you can transmit leadership. I do think you can model it mm -hmm. and develop mm -hmm. it. So the, it's the process of developing um, skills and leadership as a skill. Um, so it means we need to put students in learning environments where they actually have the opportunities to develop those skills. In the traditional classroom that I experienced as an undergrad, I, I didn't get that opportunity. I'm hoping the future classrooms, the classrooms that the people in this room and myself are creating, that we, we are giving students opportunities to actually develop those skills. I think when I first started teaching and people asked what I do, my grandmother asked me what I do, because she assumes all chemists just get stains out of the carpet. <laughs> and, and she was always asking for my advice and I never knew. Um, did, you, did you take the stain out of the carpet? I could not take the stain out. I probably put the stain <laughs> on the carpet. I did. I did the assessment, I suppose. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> But, you know, I, I first said, I teach chemistry. And after, after a little while, I started saying, you know, at the heart of it, I think I'm just teaching math. <laughs> and, and, and then I changed, you know, I'm teaching English, actually, because, you know, really understanding these procedures, writing a good lab report, especially important for our deaf and hard of hearing students. Um, but now I think, I, I would explain it, that I, I teach lifelong learning skills. Mm -hmm. I do, which, which are especially, important for our deaf and hard of hearing students and, and, and self-advocacy. It's hard to teach, maybe you have to model it, uh, but we do, I do place a large emphasis on teaching students how to be lifelong learners unto themselves. Uh, and I would tie that in with, with, with leadership. I don't have a formulaic way that I do that, but I do, I, I do try to enforce, reinforce the importance of the lifelong learning to the students. And in, in, in that, I believe leadership is encompassed. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think you need to, it has to be modeled, but I, I, like to, I like to ask my students questions. And I, I say to them, one of the great lessons I learned from my education is that nothing happens unless you make it happen. Okay? So I ask them, what will you make happen this semester? How will you affect the culture of this campus? How will you, and I try to present them in very concrete ways, opportunities, and, I'm, I, and I say to them, look, it's not like you should do this, it's that you could do this, you know? What, how will you make something new happen on campus? What will be your contribution, not only to your educational career, but to, to making this campus, you know, as wonderful as it is? And when you start asking those kinds of questions and then follow up with very specific things, like I might say, as I've said to one of my students, well, where do you want to go with this honors program? If you want to be, we have a scholarship that we only give to two students, and, if, and it's, a, it's a big process where they will go on and get a full ride to the university. So it's a really big deal when they leave us but they have to demonstrate leadership, the scholarship, et cetera. So I said, I said to her this semester, what are some of the things that you will do? What were some of the creative, innovative things? And I said, I don't wanna see you know, the Christmas angel thing. I wanna see something bigger, and how will it relate to what you wanna do? She wants to be a child advocate uh, when, you know, in social work. So those are some of the, I mean, asking those questions and then presenting very, very concrete opportunities, I think, is at least one way of of putting it in context. I don't know if you teach it, but you can ask the question. Hi, my name is David Frankel. I teach in the School of Theater and Dance. And I was wondering if you make a distinction between education and training, and if you do, what that distinction is. That's a good question. Hmm. Yes. 
What's the distinction, Lois? <laughs> uh, yeah, the distinction. No, I'm getting there. Um, uh, I, I'll talk about my creative writers, you know, the artists. Um, I, I say that you must learn your craft, all right? You must learn your craft, and, uh, and, and, that, and that your education is broader than that. Okay, You're, you, to be a truly educated human being requires more than just simply coming to the class, you know, taking notes or whatever, and then going back to your car, you know. Um, and I ask them again the question, what, what does it mean to be an educated human being, you know, and why is that a value? So again, to play off of what Todd said before about lifelong skills, I think that to me that's the broader issue about education. Um, but education, uh, especially in with the creative arts, with creative writing, there's a whole bunch of things that they need to do in, in, in order to be the artist they want to be, as you well know. You know. Uh, in fact, I was saying one of the things I wish that I had had in graduate school was a course that taught me how to deal with this kind of stuff, but <laughs> they didn't have that. So. <laughs> I think to me, training stops at the first two levels, which is to can you recall knowledge and can you apply knowledge? I think education starts when you are able to say, when do I need to apply that knowledge and why I'm applying that knowledge? And that's my short answer. Yeah, it's similar. I think I, I, think I do separate the two, maybe. You know, Mr. Senator, I categorically <laughs> deny having a good answer <laughs> to, to this question. But uh, you know, I, I do kind of vision the, the, the chemistry that I'm teaching my students uh, many of my students do go on to a career right after my program. I do kind of label that as training. I'm training them how to use instrumentation. I'm training them how to interpret data, and it's going to directly help help their employment. But I think the education comes in on you know what I just t uh, spoke about, the lifelong learning skills. I, I see that as that is education. I can give them the technical knowledge in the, as, as part of training and the lifelong learning as part of education. Uh, Mr. Senator, I have no good <laughs> answer to this question. <laughs> Do I have to answer? I think everything was said, we can go on. <laughs> Hi. Um, as a doctor, doctoral granting institution, USF is involved in uh, preparing the future faculty. What are some of your ideas about how we can prepare graduate students to become effective teachers and also help us as part of the student success movement and um, efforts that we have here at the university. I'm an advocate for preparing future faculty programs and everything of, I've understood about the good programs incorporate, incorporate things that you wouldn't just get in um, typical new faculty orientation because graduate students have all kinds of things going on. They're close in age to their students and other issues and multiple roles. And um, so there's a broader answer to that question. But I, I would, spoke, my thought is that it's much the same whether Kevin and I talked about training programs for adjunct, new faculty, even faculty who've been around for a while. It's a lot of it is knowing how learning works. So back to the, I think one of the key components is knowing what methods are going to be effective to achieve the outcomes. And so we need to look at um, models for effectiveness. And once again, research or evidence-based practices would be my sole focus. Um, and then from that, from that comes all kinds of issues about, I do separate presentations on each of these topics for faculty, but things like engaging students, motivating students, preventing incivility, um, creating clear course policies, rubrics, assignments, syllabi, you know, there's a lot of detail. In fact, I think Makichi's teaching tips now has 44 chapters or something insane like that. Um, so I'd say there's some good models out there um, to follow. Makichi is one, I think the top two books were Makichi, and then Walford's, do you remember the title of her book? <laughs> tools for Teaching, maybe it is. Davis. Yeah, Davis as Tools for Teaching. So um, I, I think there's some great models out there that were, once again, comprehensive and looking at all the detail. But if we get the underlying how students learn and how to facilitate that learning, um, that's, that's key. 
I might offer uh, uh, new students my own experience as a, as a new teacher. Uh, twice a year, usually in December and May, I would have, I got together with um, about two other uh, professors in teaching the same types of courses. And we do this informally, we do this at somebody's house, you know, we'd have tea, we'd have lunch, and we'd always begin, or we'd take notes, um, and we'd always begin the sessions with this question. What do we want to never have happen again? <laughs> and how did you do, how did you deal with X, Y, and Z? And then we would, in a very informal way, exchange kind of best practices for, you know, and then like, how did you deal with, you know, X kind of situation? And, and what, what do you think about this? And because it was informal, um, it was, a really wonderful way of, of processing what happened and then hoping for the for better for the future. Um, also, we would exchange like lessons, and I'm still using some of their some of their methods. I mean, some of their lessons have just been, and I give them credit, you know. But it's like what we tell our creative writers, you know, the old adage that good writers uh, borrow and great writers steal. And I think that's true for teachers, you know. But I did give I do give credit, and that's like a long time ago. So even though that's a real simple thing, that's that's what worked for me, and I, I might offer that to new to new teachers. I, I think it's probably wise to inform. I don't want to use the term warn mm -hmm. these graduate students who who might become faculty members of the the pressures and challenges of being a balanced mm -hmm. teacher scholar. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's, there's a lot of demands on your time and, and sometimes it's hard to figure out which direction <coughs> you should go in. I'm actually a pr proponent of a balanced teacher scholar. And I, I think individuals who are um, knowledgeable in their field often can become better teachers. Uh, you can um, you know, attack a concept from different and creative ways when you really understand that information. And I've been, I've been thrown into courses that you know, I wouldn't consider myself a content expert in, uh, and I've really struggled. I, I've used all of the good teaching techniques we've discussed here, but it, it wasn't as successful because I, I didn't have uh, that, that knowledge, that, that de deeper knowledge. So I, again, I'm a proponent of the, the, the balanced teacher scholar, but I think it's wise to, to talk to these students about the expectations and the challenges of doing that uh, as soon as they finish their degree and go on to be teachers. Um, I, since Bruce Wilcox is here, I'm going to suggest a change to our PhD program. Uh, that every student is required to take two courses, one in research methods and education, and another one in scholarship or teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Because uh, about uh, three, four decades ago, used, uh, people in science and engineering were required to know a foreign language because many of the journals were written in other languages. So it has taken, it's still not sunk into the academia that we are creating these future educators and should we make some requirement for these people? And I think uh, those two courses should be required for every PhD student who wants to teach or maybe doesn't want to teach. Uh, and also uh, what I would like uh, people to, uh, stu all students to do is to teach a class. Uh, uh, every graduate student has gone, has worked with me as a PhD student or even a master's student. I have made every attempt that they at least teach one class independently. Because time and again, it has been proven by research that good researchers may not be good teachers, but good teachers are always good researchers. Mm -hmm. Professor mm -hmm. Kaur, let me assure you that we think alike on this. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you so much. We've had conversations in the past. The challenge for you is to convince your colleagues of the importance. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I can give you this assurance mm -hmm. that our graduate school under the leadership of uh, Karen and mm -hmm. Apley are both providing support services for active PhD students or doctoral uh, okay. students at, at the university. So we provide the support at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. We do not require it. I happen to believe it's in the best interests of PhD students. It's That's going right. to make them much more competitive uh, when they reach out into the market if higher education is, uh, is, is a pathway that they're pursuing. We have a question over here. Hi, I'm Emily Cologne, and I work in the Office of Admissions here at the university, and I also am a graduate student studying public administration, and I'm just interested in hearing from you guys what you feel is the single greatest challenge in higher education today. 
I got no pressure. Uh, who can we start with? Todd, you want to take yeah, that one? Yeah, I'll be quick. And, and this one's kind of obvious. I, I think funding. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, you need the funding to, to, to run your university. I guess I'm referring to when the funding is reduced. You know, how, how do you have all your services? How do you put it up a nice um, tutoring, interactive tutoring center that you have? How, how do you do some of the things that uh, USF is doing so well and leading by example? Um, you know, my institution is federally funded and we are dealing with congressional sequestration right now. And it, it's, it's, it's a tough time for people. Uh, the, the economy is tough. and. When there, when there is less funding, that it's harder to support a lot of these ancillary or, or important services that you can provide for students. Um, so uh, that may be too obvious of an answer, but it's certainly on my mind right now. And we're working with our administration on trying to figure out, you know, how we how we can uh, uh, teach the best that we can in this tough economical climate. I, I think the biggest challenge to higher education is access for low-income students. Yes. Uh, time and again, it has been shown that uh, when you have low-income students, uh, we tend to think that they're not bright. I'll give you statistics. 34% of our brightest students do come from the upper-income quartile. However, still 17% of the brightest students, as defined by the regular standards of SAT scores and GPAs and things like that, do come from the lowest-income quartile. So at the same time, you only have one out of 25 students attending our 146 selective universities. Mm -hmm. So you're very much seeing that not only is the access not there, but also they're not getting a quality education to begin with. So I think uh, having access to the low-income students is extremely important for the equality in the society which we so desire to take place. I totally agree. I totally agree. I'm going to say, uh, resistance to change. I, I, um, and I use that as a perfect example. If we know this and we have these statistics, there's something standing in the way of our making something happen on that. I just heard your provost say, I mean, almost everyone nodded their head that this is something we think graduate students should do, but either we don't maybe to have the funding, it may go back to that, or in my experience when I visit campuses, it's, it's often just there are these pockets of resistance, basically. So sometimes it's, well, we, we have the stats to support. This is what's going to help our students be successful. But for whatever reason, people resist change. And change is difficult, and that's perhaps why. But I, I would say resistance to change is the bigger, uh, more broad concern, in my opinion. Afternoon. Uh, my name is Sherman Doran. And uh, let me ask a, a maybe a somewhat related question. At your own institutions, you've been talking about what you do inside your classroom, your passion, what's inside your heart and heads and your relationship with your students. You haven't yet talked about what goes on outside your classroom. If you could identify one thing that you think your students need when they step outside the door of your classroom that your institution should be providing, what should that be? that would make the most difference? I might say after they leave, I step outside my classroom in terms of our campus, our college, is, is I think they need to experience the culture of the campus. And that, that what that means is um, that we, we as a group, we as the educators of Paradise Valley Community College all have a common vision. I do believe that's true for my campus. I, I'm, I am an advocate um, and, and, and truly, uh, truly blessed to work among these people. But from the, the person that, uh, that tells the students where, where they can park to the architect uh, and the committee that created our Center for the Performing Arts, to the, the courses that are offered that are not offered, to the people who run our honors program, to our, our faculty who take uh, the students on archaeological digs, to our uh, faculty member who put together our, uh, we have a cadaver lab, to the, you know, all of it, you know, is, and people, and the students will come to me and say, this is a great place. 
And I say to them, yes. But as I've said over and over and over again, since winning this award, since being given this award, that um, good teaching doesn't happen in a vacuum, you know? I was able to, to, to do the things I wanted to do on my campus, in the, in the campus and within the, within the campus community, because everybody supported that common vision. And that, you know, that may seem really obvious, it seems obvious to me, but it takes a great amount of effort and leadership and everybody to be on the same page. But without that culture, I, I think then you are this, you know, you have this tiny, tiny note in this whirlwind of, of, of stuff that we call education. And, and while I think that that's important, it's so much better when we have an orchestra instead of just one little symbol going ting, ting, ting. Um, my answer goes back to, I think it was the initial question about the last lecture, because I, I didn't have an opportunity to answer the last lecture question, and I, I think mine would be, if I could muster it up, the secret to successful living. And uh, <laughs> I think I found the answer, and it was, in, um, it was on your campus yesterday. It, it was a flag hanging outside the intramural fields. Maybe you've seen it. It simply said, uh, USF, make an impact. <laughs> I think that's the secret. If we were all out there making an impact, and what I, what I wrote down is that my hope is that we are inspiring students to make the world a better place, whether it's through chemistry, through, chemical, through engineering, through the creative arts, through psychology and other social sciences. You know, our students, we should be inspiring students to get out there and make the world Absolutely. a better place. Um, and then we can sleep at night. Hi. I'm Travis Thompson, and I'm an administrator within undergraduate studies and also a doctoral candidate here at the University of South Florida. And I'd like to draw on your answer, uh, hopefully in both roles. So if we take learning to be a creative enterprise uh, that's process-based and also one that involves change, what are some of the ways that you balance the tensions of fostering creative spaces while also balancing concrete, uh, political, geographical, physical realities or settings. You guys are up. Lois and I just Yeah, we did. Time. Go, guys. <laughs> the term creative was used. Oh, <laughs> so it's paid to write. What, me? <laughs> yeah, all, this is your thing. Yes, you do it. OK. Um, let me paraphrase, and this is what I do when I don't understand a student. Let me think. I, let me. Think, say what I think you, you're asking me, and then you can tell me if I'm right or not. The, how do you balance the practical with the theoretical? Is that what I'm hearing? It's a little bit of that. <laughs> okay. Do you wanna? Uh, so, well, learning, if we take learning, maybe not just for students, but also learning as a professor in oh, the okay. practical setting of a classroom, how, how do you balance the tension of creating creative spaces for transformative learning to take place, but within what are often concrete political oh, or physical I, settings? I do feel, I mean, everything we're moving toward, all the what we call pedagogies of engagement, service learning or community engagement, uh, authentic practice in terms of internship and um, undergraduate research, everything authentic. We get out there in the real world, and so the classroom, we're not limited to the classroom space is, is the answer. As a, as a writer uh, and working with my other fine arts faculty, we're working artists, and I think that makes a really big difference in, in teaching my students in creative writing because I come to the classroom um, and say, look, you know, some of these challenges I am putting to you, I am currently engaged in. Um, and I do a lot of work on a national level within my professional organization and try to bring back to the campus, whether it's in the form of opportunities or speakers or information or scholarship, you know, to my students. So they feel real, at least I hope they feel, connected to this larger scope. Um, and and our, our campus is really, uh, uh, very proactive in creating uh, opportunities that are linked to very uh, specific course content. Uh, 
you know, as you said, uh, internships, but other, other things as well. So it's kind of like, as you were saying before, a holistic approach. Yeah. Um, but I think there's something um, that the students respect when I say, well, you know, I'm, I know how you feel because I also don't have enough time. You know, I am, or I've just come back from a, a postdoc um, uh, workshop. So I understand what it's like to be sitting there in the classroom and, and having people talk about my work, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that that, that kind of raises the bar a little bit in terms of comfort and trust, but also in terms of challenging them, you know. So I hope that answers some of your questions. I, I think you're right, though. I, I think that not all creative pedagogies lead to the benchmarks and the successes that you want. I mean, just because it's new doesn't mean it's, doesn't mean it's good. And hopefully, if, if you find out that it's not effective, you'll go a different direction. But you know, I, I visited the tutor, tutor, your tutoring center today, um, and you know, they they are they have a creative space there, and they have some benchmarks to document that they are in fact doing what they say they're doing, and they are increasing uh, grades or, or passing grades by 15 percent uh, over the over the years by by using this model. So you have to really assess. It goes back to the self-reflection. Just because you did it doesn't mean that you should do it again because the work has been done one time. It's easier to do it the second time. You, you've got to really assess whether it's worked or not. Um, and, and like I said, not every, not every idea, they're, they're good, but not every idea will lead to the teaching of your, of your learning objectives, the benchmarks that you or your university or, or, or future employers have set on your students. So you sometimes have to do a pivot, if you will, and, and go in a different direction after you assess that. I'm baffled by the question, so I'm, <laughs> going, to the, I'm going to do the best I can. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, there, there was a memo which was sent in our university that please don't change the learning spaces like moving your chairs and things like that because it violates the fire code. If somebody can solve that problem, I think we have one answer to your question. <laughs> Hello, my name is Roger Brindley. I'm a faculty member in the College of Education, and I want to bounce off my colleague Sherman's question a, a minute ago. Um, but Todd, I heard earlier in the afternoon you talk about the idea of I wish I had known to tell some of my colleagues as a young professor to be quiet, sure. get out of the way, I'm coming sure. through. Mm -hmm. sure. Lois, you just articulate the vision of a utopian campus, whether you meant to or not. It sounded fantastic. <laughs> Sherman asked a question about students. I want to ask a question about your faculty colleagues. How does your teaching go outside of your teaching environment and affect your faculty colleagues around you? How have you been able, perhaps you can tell us of a process, a structure, or a story that illustrates how you've been able to, to sort of help your colleagues come on this rise, uh, ride with you to, to uh, help with the betterment of the broader student population? I'll, I'll take an easy part. Maybe I'll give you the, the hard part. Uh, I haven't. I haven't figured out necessarily how to do that with the more senior and veteran faculty, but through good mentoring, I think you really can instill these good practices on newer faculty. Um, so I've been involved in setting up a, a mentoring program in my institution where we do co-teaching, and it, it, it's a formal mentoring that, that um, the new faculty are, are required to be involved in. And I, I think we have, gone a long way in showing them good traits, discussing good, good teaching skills. Uh, so that's kind of the easier one, I think, is, is, is the, the younger faculty, the, the, the junior faculty. Um, I'll be honest, I have the same question. Uh, you know, if, if there's time, I might throw it out to the collective audience on, on how, you, how, how you change that or you shift the paradigm in um, educators' minds who have, who have been doing it the way they've been doing it for a long time, resistance mm -hmm. to change. I, I don't have an answer for that, but if any, any of the collective audience does, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I've just had the, you know, I'm 23 years in, something like that, and just recently ha finally had that experience, and I, the only reason I'm here among my colleagues is that I've had the fortunate opportunity to have some research that was of real interest to people across the country, so I've been able to give faculty development workshops at you know, 70 institutions or something like that and do all kinds of conference keynotes and things. But, but even more important is that at my own institution, 
we were able to do a course redesign project that involved about a third of our faculty. And we used, as I said earlier, Judith Blumberg's uh, learning-centered teaching workbook. And over the course of a semester meeting um, pretty much every other week in small groups, we all redesigned our courses. Um, so I, I, now I see on our campus, and, and our campus was a campus that I would have never said um, we would have a majority of our faculty on board with um, teaching that was learning-centered or student-centered. Um, we had a lot, a lot, a lot of faculty resistance. It was one of those institutions where people prided themselves on students failing and so forth. Complete change in our, and it's a, what I would call a tipping point sort of thing. Um, years ago, just 10 years ago, you, you kind of were looked down upon if you were engaging, if you were good at what you did. Today, it's the exact opposite. There is now social pressure for those people who are resisting. And so I think it's a social movement, and it's, it's only, it can't be created by your administrators. It can be supported by your administrators, but it has to be a grassroots movement created by you. Um, and so I'm a huge advocate of what people like Kevin do in the centers to facilitate that as well. But it has to be faculty and I would say engaging, strategically engaging faculty role models and leaders yes. within each of the departments um, to create. And then other faculty see how that has an impact on students. And it, it can happen. And for us, it happened in less than a couple of years. It just took off once we really got a good group of faculty voted. But I, I will say, when I'm speaking on other campuses, I'll say hiring practices are critical, <laughs> um, that we, we're still making the mistake of hiring people who don't get, yes, we want you to be researchers and scholars, but we want you to be teacher scholars. So we need to be hiring the right people and making it clear up front what our expectations are that this is a campus where we are devoted to students and student success as well as our research. Uh, First, my, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Ahead, no, on my campus, we, um, the fine arts people, uh, we, we do a lot of collaborative work together. Um, we really like each other a lot, uh, and so that, that makes it kind of wonderful. Um, for example, I'm writing a jazz opera with my colleague who's a composer. Um, the visual art uh, ceramicist has worked with our percussionists. So that's been really wonderful. But over, over, over uh, on the other side of campus are our science colleagues and so forth. Uh, we've, made, we've made efforts. Well, one of the things I did, quite simply, was walk across campus and start talking to them and inviting them mm -hmm. to, to certain um, events that we had. But over and above, something, something I created a couple of years ago uh, I think was very effective in, in um, kind of bringing us all together on the same page. Uh, I went to our, our sa faculty senate and proposed that we, I, create a, uh, a tribute to teaching and learning essay contest, uh, which was open to everybody. It had to be a, 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 student on, a student who was enrolled or is enrolled in our campus. It had to be an essay uh, that was about a full-time person, because it was full-time uh, faculty senate. And then what I did, we, we got an outside judge. We judged the contest. I, I put, uh, put it together in a, in a little booklet. And then what I did was I, would, I excerpted parts of it and, and sent it out, uh, sent out, and I did it across disciplines so nobody felt that, you know, we had economics with, you know, Spanish or whatever, um, and sent it out and said, this is what your students are saying about you. I archived it and also I made like 20 copies and gave it to our governing board because I know that they don't know what we do. You know, so that was really kind of, and now they've picked it, I mean, it was a lot of work to do, but that, that was a kind of way, a positive way of saying, hey, look, look at where you work and look how wonderful these teachers are and look at your colleagues and aren't you proud of yourselves? And I want to say this as we're coming towards the end of today, that first of all, thank you, my colleagues, but thank you, uh, all of you for coming and for your hospitality. And if I can say one thing, if I could end by just saying one thing, is that what you do, what we do matters. 
If you come out with one thing, if you remember nothing that I've said to you, it's that what we do matters. I don't care what anybody says to you. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care how much money we have, we don't have. You know, we're going to do it, and, and it counts, and it matters, and this is how you change the world even though my husband says I'm an idealist. But, you know, you know, but I say to him, but if, you're, if nobody's out there, you know, fighting the good fight, then how do you ever change anything? So We have so. time for one final question, and it's going to come from a very important person. And in my summing up, I'll explain why this person is so important. Monica? <laughs> 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 Monica's concerned. Yes, I am. It's like, you know something I don't? Um, my question has to do with, um, not. I'm from the library, by the way. Monica Metzweiss is from the library. And my question has to do with books, but a different sort of book, and that is the textbook. It used to be that students would have bragging rights if they were a senior and they'd never come to the library. Now they have bragging rights when they say, I got six A's and I never had to buy my textbook. My question is, what do you consider to be the future of the textbook and its value in teaching and learning now and forward? <laughs> they're, they're like exhausted. <laughs> Monica, I'm glad, say, <laughs> I'm glad that you asked the question because I know the answer to it, <laughs> or at least I know, think that I know the answer to it. Uh, I think it's going to come more as packages as opposed to just the textbook itself. Uh, you're going to have multimedia content through the textbook. You're going to have adaptive learning taking place. So you're asking questions right after certain sections of a chapter and being able to see that maybe uh, the student needs to take a different direction. Maybe he needs to be... Uh, pointed towards a different part of the chapter. Uh, so th those are my views in that. But I think it's a very difficult thing to do, especially with the way the publishers are trying to approach this particular problem, where they're not giving full access to the books for a long period of time, uh, finding time and again that you can only use the e-book for one semester, and if it's a prerequisite for another class, they cannot use it, they have to buy it again. So I think that model has to change. Uh, but I see a lot of positives in the way the e-books are now being mm -hmm. made in terms of you can make annotations, students can talk to each other, they can make their own annotations and their fellow students can see their annotations, the teacher can see those annotations. So if we have all the interaction taking place within the textbook itself, uh, I think it's a win-win for everybody. I think, I think you're right, you do, have, you do have the right answer there and it's, it, just building off what you said, it, it's what I said about the future classroom as well. It's, it's mixed modalities. There, there's not one right thing. And, and even a textbook, even in, 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 in the past, not all <coughs> students learned well from the textbooks, but some really did. They, they learned well. So I, I think you're right. There, there, there's going to be a shift to a holistic multimedia approach where I think the textbook is still going to have some, if not reference, <laughs> value to the students but it's going to be supplemented with, with multimedia and, and other technologies to kind of kind of resonate, I think, with the classroom of the future. Yeah, to that I would add uh, information literacy becomes even more critical sure. now than ever before and will sure. continue to be critical so that we're not just using textbooks as one source for students, but we're helping them to find sources from articles and other things all over to to figure out which sources are accurate and legitimate and all of these things, that becomes even a greater challenge. But I see it as becoming much more exploratory. And as you said, the textbook's moving into more of a multimedia, not a physical textbook, is, um, although I'm a firm believer in that we, you know, the solid, the firm book will still exist as we know it, and, um, but that things will change, continue to change, I guess. As a writer, you know, I have a fondness for print-based <laughs> books, but um, I do think that our definition of a textbook is going to change. Yeah. And the know. world. As I was sitting in the smart lab today, I was thinking that it would be such a great application to use, I know it would be like a gazillion million dollars, but, you know, to use that as a, as a textbook, you know, to have, to have it a 3D, like here you are actually 
listening to Socrates or listening to <laughs> Anne Sexton. How right? great would that, or, or we were talking before to, to maybe do imaging of the brain as the students are in their flow of the creative <laughs> process. How terrific would that be, right. you know? Or maybe, maybe even talk back to, you know, the writer, have the writer, you know, how great would that, so I think our definition's gonna change, but I, you know, I just happen to think that the print isn't gonna go away, because it's just so nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, uh, on that point, Monica, you're probably wondering why you are so special. So. And it really comes back to a comment that Christy shared earlier, and that is that student success uh, t is, a, is a movement. And it's a conversation that Paul, Dorsell, and I have had, and others have had over the years, that we realize from the outset that this isn't something that you can impose mm -hmm. on a community. The community has to own this. Yes. So the reason why I said Monica is so important, she said, I'm a librarian. She's much more than a librarian. We have a remarkably talented team of student affairs leaders here this afternoon. You're not privileged to uh, know who everyone is in the audience. Our academic advisors, our graduate school, undergraduate studies, instructional and information technology. Uh, it's all of you that make this happen. I was particularly intrigued by the conversation you were having about content acquisition, or knowledge acquisition, and skill and competency mm -hmm. development. We're hearing uh, through our career center today that employers are as interested in graduates uh, that um, leave the University of South Florida with an understanding of how to promote collaboration, mm -hmm. how to work in teams, uh, in, in partnership with one another, problem solving skills, broadly writ, not specifically in engineering. By the way, the, uh, uh, the question that mystified you came from a graduate of the College of Engineering. <laughs> so, uh, it may have mystified you, perhaps it shouldn't have surprised you, however. Uh, but uh, we'll coach him next time. And, uh, and no, I think forward. I need to be coached. <laughs> But in closing, and I do have to wrap this up very, very quickly because I'm already late for a faculty senate meeting and you know what that means uh, for the provost. Who knows if I've still got a job uh, <laughs> at, at the moment. But um, in all seriousness, uh, this, is, uh, this has been a session that many of us will remember for many, many years. Uh, thank you so much for generously giving of your time, uh, your wisdom, your experience, uh, in helping us uh, better shape uh, a future for students at the University of South Florida. We're very, very proud of what we've accomplished in a relatively short time here. Uh, we're certainly not satisfied, and we realize there's work yet to be done. Uh, there's plenty of refreshments on the, side of the, uh, on the side here at the back for the introverts who are in the audience. <laughs> uh, you have an opportunity to continue the conversation with our guests for a little while. Uh, but most particularly, I want to thank you uh, for taking your time and demonstrating uh, to the USF community how important student success is to you. Thank you. Thank you.